gonna tell y'all a story, but it's not a happy story. It's a story from when I was in college. There were two people that I got to know really well my freshman year, got to know them pretty early on in my freshman year. Their names were Cheryl and Ed. <laughs> Ed was a jerk. Ed was a grade A, all in capital letters, jerk. And, but he still apparently was handsome. I never quite got that, but apparently he was. And um, Ed and Cheryl started a dance that went on for two years, the beginning of my freshman year. Now Cheryl was a sweet girl, I have to admit, freshman year, I hadn't met Laura yet, I had kind of a crush on her, so that probably colors my perspective a little. But she had been through a lot in her life. Just to give you kind of the Cliff Notes version of it, very difficult situation with a broken home that was badly blown open. And then her first boyfriend that she had when she was 14, and was still her boyfriend when she came to college, was 24 years old when they started dating. Okay, all the dads in the room just started looking for a firearm somewhere. Um, just bad news. And Cheryl loved Ed. Thought he was the most wonderful guy out there. And kept trying to be in a relationship with him. Now, Ed had about eight different relationships. And in between each one, he'd go back to Cheryl. And all of us who loved them both, because they were both my friends, on the one hand, we're going, Ed, stop being a jerk. And on the other hand, going, can't you see this is not good for you? Can't you see this is not a good idea? Going back to this guy over and over again, not helpful. And no, go, don't go home to your boyfriend from before either. <laughs> we love Cheryl. Some of us prayed for Cheryl. Some of my friends freshman year were not Christian at all, so they didn't really pray. But... We tried and tried and tried to help her find a healthier way in her life. We tried and tried to help her find a way to, to, to live without needing a guy in her life for a while. We tried to be there for her and to, to hold her up in the midst of all that was going on. But whatever we did, it didn't seem like it ever did any good. Because over and over and over again, she just kept after this same foolish idea of being with Ed. And I think we've all seen that at least. That relative or that friend that has a taste in men that is somewhere down here. That guy that keeps on going after girls that are not interested and not looking at the ones that are interested. That friend who somehow has a radar that you walk into a room together and they automatically find the most unreliable human being they possibly can and go, oh, that's who I want to be with. Not that I'm pointing at anyone in particular, just to be honest, pointing out the window, one of the cars or something, you know. But, but that idea that, that it seems like sometimes people just get into their heads this idea that they are <coughs> going to love someone and they just can't help it, and it just happens to them. And of course, this is fed by Hollywood. I mean, how many Hollywood stories are there out there about somebody pining after somebody else forever and ever and ever and ever, and they do all this ridiculous stuff, and then finally, at the end of the movie, just before the credits roll, they get together. Now, that happens in Disney movies, but in real life, not so much. And if it does, usually not a good idea. And so that's why this... Sunday, we're talking about summer loving, and now last week we talked about puppy love and how cute it was, and this week we're going to talk about stupid love. Because sometimes love is stupid. Because sometimes we do stupid things and we make stupid choices because of love or what we think is love that really isn't. And there is a perfect case in the Bible of exactly this kind of love. His name was Samson. And if you want to find somebody who had the most potential and did the least with it in the entirety of history, it's Samson. 
Here's somebody who God gave this incredible strength, this ability to say, you know, and for some of you who've seen the Avengers movie, you know, and Loki comes up and he's talking to Iron Man and he says, ah, I've got an army. And Iron Man looks at him and goes, we have a Hulk. And, and Samson was like the Hulk. I mean, he could win the battle all by himself. There's one time where the thousand Philistines are coming on him. It's only him. The only weapon he's got is the jawbone of a donkey, and he kills them all. Can you imagine the Israel legend? Yes, we'll follow you into battle. Yes, let's go and fight off the Philistines. That's fine. Samson, why don't you stand in front, and we'll be right there backing you up. Instead, well, this is what he does. We'll start in chapter 14. Then Samson went down to Timnah. Now, Timnah is a place where the Philistines, it's a Philistine town, it's a town full of Philistines. And saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. <coughs> then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you have to go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Give her for me, for she looks good to me. <laughs> How do I put this delicately? He may be hot right now. She may be really good looking. But the calendar is not going to stop moving. <laughs> the reality is that what's on the outside changes in face. It does. All the time. And he might be hot now, but five years from now, not so much. Especially if he's been eating well. <laughs> she might look really awesome now, but you know what? Gravity is gravity. <laughs> what I find funny about that is the ladies are laughing much louder than the men. Um, the reality is that so often in our minds and our hearts, we look at someone... And we're like Samson. We're like, ooh, they look good to me. That's the one I want. There is no sillier thing to base a relationship on than how somebody looks. And not just because it changes, but because guess what? There's very little they had to do or they did to look the way that they do. They did not add to their height. The reality is that as much as our our culture loves to talk about getting healthy and being healthy and it focuses on weight and shape and all that stuff. Most of us came to the party with a particular package. And we can change that package a little bit one way or a little bit another way, but between genetics and time, the package is the package. And it's not going to change. So it's not like they did something incredible to look the way that they look. It just kind of happened. And you can only look at somebody for so long before whatever is in their heart, whatever is in their character, whatever they're actually like, starts speaking so much louder. I liken it to the whole new car syndrome. You get a new car because it's pretty. You get a new car because it smells like a new car. You get a new car because you think it's cooler than your old car. But after you've been driving the car for six months, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter whether it still smells like a new car. It's just transportation. And things like how reliable the engine is. Things like whether or not the tires are about to wear out. Things like whether or not you can brake within a reasonable distance of what your gas mileage is. Matters a whole lot more. And not to compare love relationships to a relationship with a car. But the reality is that the things that go on in the heart and the soul and the mind are the things that are like whether or not the car burns oil and the kind of gas mileage it gets. They're the kind of things that make a relationship or break a relationship. And the wrapping paper is the wrapping paper. It's nice. But it's not what's most important. And it's certainly not something that can bear the weight of deciding that we are going to love this person because of the way they look. 
Now, Samson, after this ill-advised situation, we find out that indeed, this was not a great choice. His father goes, he arranges everything, Samson's going to get married, so he and his family go down to Timnah, and they have the wedding. Now here, when we have a wedding, we have seven months, anywhere up to seven years, of planning, and buying, and setting up, and catering, and all of that stuff. And then we have about eh, three or four hours worth of wedding and reception. Well, at this time, you had about seven hours worth of planning and seven days worth of party. So they're in Timnah, they're having their seven day wedding party. And, and because Samson is there all alone with just his family, he doesn't have his young friends to have a bachelor party with him. They go ahead and the people of Timnah give him 30 friends. Now the funny thing is the Hebrew kind of could go either way. It's like, well, they sort of did it because they felt bad for him and they wanted to have him for his friends there, some, somebody to be friends for him. But it also, the word can be used to talk about, they wanted to send 30 people to keep an eye on him because they already figured that he might be dangerous. Not completely clear as to which one it is, and probably their motives were a little bit of both. During this time, he proposes a riddle. And the riddle is based on him killing a lion and then bees setting up, you know, bees setting up a honeycomb inside the lion and him going ahead and taking the honey. And, and so he sets up this riddle. He makes him a bet and says, okay, each of you give me one set of good clothes or I'll give all of you one set of good clothes each if you can guess my riddle. Well, after halfway through the feast, he gets in this situation where they can't figure out the riddle, but they're getting upset and more and more upset about it. So they go to his wife-to-be and pressure her and threaten her and tell her, if you don't find out from your husband what the riddle is, we're going to kill you and we're going to kill your family. Now, for whatever reason, she doesn't seem to go to Samson about it. Instead, she badgers him. She nags him day after day. The seven days of... of celebration for the wedding turn into seven days of her crying and saying, you don't really love me because you won't tell me the answer to the riddle. You don't really love me because you, you don't trust me enough to give me the answer to the riddle, which of course is the wise thing to do. Because the minute he gives her the answer to the riddle, she gives it to the gods. And then this is what happens in verse 15. And it says, then it came about on the fourth day, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Then it came about on the fourth day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband so that he will tell us the riddle, or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to impoverish us? Is this not so? I'm not so sure about impoverish us. You know, they said that, but they were only going to have to give him one suit of nice clothes, which definitely did not cost as much as going to men's warehouse now, just to be clear. All right. Uh, Samson's wife wept before him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have propounded a riddle to the sons of my people, and they had, you have not told it to me. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father and mother, so why should I tell you? However, she wept before him seven days while their feast lasted, and on the seventh day he told her because she pressed him so hard. Then she told the riddle to the sons of her people. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. <laughs> Little cultural difference there. Not quite as insulting as it sounds now, just to be clear. But still... Samson doesn't find out, bother to find out about her character. And sure enough, instead of coming to him, who is, you know, this huge strapping warrior of a man and saying, they're threatening my family, will you protect them? She nags him to death for seven days, weeping and bawling and crying her eyes out and begging him to give her the riddle. And then she hands it over to her people. And they defeat him. He gets mad about it and leaves. And when he leaves, his father-in-law to be decides he didn't really want to marry the girl, so he marries the girl off to one of the friends, which, if you'll remember, aren't really Samson's friends. They were given by the people of the village. Samson shows up a while later with a young goat so that he can come sleep with his wife. 
A little weird, don't you think? A little weird to me, too. I'm thinking he doesn't really understand the whole marriage thing all that well. He shows up anyway. And as he shows up, and his father-in-law says, Look, I really thought that you hated her, given that at the end of the wedding time, you left in a huff and went back home and wouldn't speak to any of us. So I married her off to somebody else. And then the father shows how bright he is by going, Don't you want her younger sister instead? Different culture, different time. A little crazy to me. I can't really see that going, of go, going over well with any of my daughters. If I said, well, this one doesn't want to marry you anymore, will you take another one? <laughs> no. I might not survive that experience. Um, so, Samson gets mad. He's frustrated. He doesn't get to be with this girl that he saw from afar. He's still got bearing a torch for her, and I guess that gives him the idea. And so he takes torches, and he ties them to foxes, and then he lets the foxes loose in the Philistines' grain, and they basically burn up the entire harvest. They get mad. And then we see the only time Judah musters an army. You see, Samson has left the Philistine village now that he's done his damage and gotten his revenge. And while he's up in the hills, the Philistines show up. And they're afraid to go tackle Samson. So they show up around the village of the people of Judah, and they go, you need to get Samson for us. And the only time we see the Israelites mustering an army during the whole time of Samson is when they muster up an army to go get him and turn him over to the Philistines. After they turn him over to the Philistines, we have, as I mentioned before, where he kills a thousand of them with the jawbone of a donkey and becomes militarily victorious and ready to lead the nation. Now think about this for a minute. What's happened here is that the Philistines have come out of their power to take one man into custody and execute him. They bring that one man into custody, and even their Israelites come and they hand him over. So you've got the whole army of Israelites, uh, not all of Israel, but this particular tribe, this particular group of Judah, they're standing there, they've just turned Samson over. And Samson immediately slaughters all of these Philistines. I think there was a little bit of cheering going. I think that the, that the army that was waiting and watching, they were probably, you know, chanting his name and doing the wave and everything else they could to, to let him know how much they supported what was going on. What a moment for Samson to have turned to them and said, that's it. We're going to drive the Philistines out of our land. We're going to knock them off the edge and back into the sea and take back our cities and take back and quit being their slaves. But what does he do? He goes and he looks for a spring and he gets a drink. And the next time we hear of him is in chapter 16. And this is where it just gets depressing. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. And when it was told to the Gazaites, Samson's come here, they surrounded the place and laid in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. And they kept silent all night, saying, Let us wait until the morning light, and we will kill him. Now Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two posts and pulled them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the mountain, which is opposite Hebron. So in 20 years of judging, the next thing that we hear of any note that Samson did is he pulled a party trick. He went and he found a prostitute down among the Philistines again. Not a smart idea. And then when they tracked him and they caught him and they knew he was there, he yanked up the city gates, which is thousands and thousands of pounds worth of wood and metal, put it on top of a mountain, basically to say, so there, and left. With his great strength and his great power, his lack of self-restraint, his stupid affection for apparently whatever woman of negotiable virtue might be around. And he wastes his great strength on a party trick. I'm picking up the gates and moving them. Even then, 20 years into him being a judge, he could have rallied his people. He could have said, where Gaza wanted to attack me, let's go down and take him out. I removed the city gate, now we can walk right into the city and take it over. But no, the very next verse. After this it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Everybody knows who Delilah is. 
And the lords of the Philistines came to her and said to her, Entice him, see where his great strength lies, and how we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And then we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. And so here's Samson. And he's decided that he's fallen in love with a woman who is ready to be paid off to sign his death warrant. With a woman who is ready to be paid off to see him captured. We've all had a brush with stupid love. We've all had a crush on somebody that we knew we shouldn't have. We've all pursued it a little further than we ought to. Some of us have stayed interested in someone that's made it clear they weren't interested in us. We've all pursued relationships that we knew were bad for us. And even if we didn't go to the extremes that Samson did, <coughs> we've hurt ourselves. We have missed out on the plan God would have had for our life without that mistake. And that's the thing about Samson. Samson is here. Samson is doing these things. And it's not so much the awfulness of his, of his actions. It's not so much the horribleness of what he's done. It's not so much that he visited a prostitute or those things. It's that God equipped him and made him ready and made it possible for him to lead the nation of Israel into an incredible triumph. And because he was busy chasing his own desires, because he was busy getting what he wanted in that moment, regardless of whether it was wise or unwise, regardless of whether it was stupid or whether it was smart, because he just wanted what he wanted and he just went for what he wanted without thought or forethought or working through it, he missed out on the what could have been and instead wasted his life. And we know how the story ends. Delilah finally nags him to the point where he tells her his secret. And she cuts off his hair, and he loses his strength. And he's captured. And yes, in the end, his hair grows back, and he gets his strength, and he prays to God one last time, and he has victory over his enemies. <coughs> but it is just as hollow and empty and meaningless as all the other victories he had. Because, yeah, he killed some Philistines, but he didn't free his people. He killed some Philistines, but he didn't change the situation. He killed some Philistines, but he did not lead his people to the Lord. He left them wanting and waiting for the leader he could have and should have been. The problem with stupid love is not that we're stupid. The problem with stupid love is not that... that It's not the dumb things that we do to try to get it or earn it or find it or make somebody love us. The problem with stupid love is it distracts us from the real thing. The problem with stupid love is it pulls us away from the things that really matter in our lives. Not just from the potential of a relationship with someone who truly loves us, but it pulls us away from our love of God. Because our Heavenly Father cannot look approvingly upon us destroying our lives. And we know somehow that the closer we get to Him, the further we're pulled away from these foolish choices and onto the right ones. Really, when it comes to what we need to do, I think there are two things. One of them is we do need to search our lives for something that we're loving foolishly. <coughs> Maybe it's that cable package that we really want. Maybe it's the new golf clubs. Maybe it's a new car. Maybe it's another car. Maybe it's another house. Maybe it's not a, a thing, but it's a relationship or a particular job or a particular amount of money or this much in the IRA. But that there's something that we are lusting after in our life that's foolish and fading and pointless and doesn't really give us anything of value. And God is calling us to see that and identify it and call it what it is. And let it go. And my encouragement to you is to let that go. The second thing is for that friend, for that neighbor, for that relative, for that loved one who is 
trapped in the cycle of stupid love. We can be like Samson's parents all day long and say, why would you want to marry her? Isn't there somebody in the village that you like? We can tell them how stupid what they're doing is all day long, and will they listen? Really, you can answer. No. <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> the only thing we can do is love them with the genuine love of Christ, and pray that they will see Christ's love in us, and that that real love will expose the counterfeit of the stupid love. And it's hard, because what we want to do is go, what are you thinking? What we want to do is go, hey, you really thought about being with this person? What we want to do is we want to step in and say, you think you want that job, but you really don't want that job because it's nothing like what you think it's going to be. But instead of falling on deaf ears with that, we love them. We support them. We care about them. We show them the love of Christ in whatever way we can in their life by caring for them, by being there for them, by listening to them, by <coughs> helping them. And then we pray that God uses that to connect them with Him. Because if they begin finding the satisfaction of a relationship with Him and His love within them, they will be so much more able to let their fingers off of that stupid love and find something worth having. This morning as we receive our offering, it's an opportunity to respond to what we've been talking about, to this concept of stupid love. And you'll notice that on your, in your bulletin, in your uh, connection card, on the back it's got, it's got three different ways to react to this sermon. One is trusting in Christ for your salvation. Like we talked about as we were doing communion. That idea of putting your trust in Him for forgiveness instead of yourself for being good enough. The second one is, I will remember the story of Samson the infatuated. And the idea is that as you remember it, it will help you see where maybe you're falling the same way. And the last one is, I will let go of my stupid love. If you would go ahead and check what applies and put it into the offering plate as it comes by. Just receive the offering.